what legacy would you like to leave? I always think about the legacy as being your uh, tombstone. You know, what, what, are, <laughs> what are they going to etch on your tombstone? Um, that epitaph. You know, I think what would I like said about me as, as a person, as that my personal legacy or something physical, tangible? Well, I think what's the memory that you're leaving behind that somebody could say, oh, Charlotte Moss, she was. I would like for them to say that I was uh, generous, mm -hmm. that I was fair, um, that my energy or my enthusiasm may have inspired them somewhere along the line. Um, and also, um, through teaching and lecturing, that I have the opportunity to pass along something that I've learned that may, you know, strike a chord with other people. Um, I think that would be the greatest thing. Generous and um, enthusiasm, curious. That would be pretty terrific. And I from that, what I know, that, you're in a perfect underway. world, that's what I would like. Yes, yes. <laughs> they might also, I, they might say a few other things. <laughs> look, look, I'm I'm tough. I'm tough on myself. Um, like I said, we're not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I know my shortcomings. I have right. a short fuse. Um, I have little patience um, for things like laziness. No. Right. Well. Rather than me ask you all the questions, I think we should open it up to the audience and see what they have to say or ask. Good with that? No, I'm, I'm, I'm so ready. It's your turn. So what we're going to do is there are two mics, and Christine has one, and uh, we're, somebody else will have that in a second. And so just raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll bring the mic to you. So first question. There's a question out there, right there. Charlotte, you talk about having uh, very high expectations of yourself, uh, and I'd just like to know how you deal with um, employees who don't necessarily share that, or what you do to encourage them to get to your level of commitment. Well, I think as an employer, one, you are the one in the company that sets the example. And um, whether it's you know, how you look in the morning to how you act all day long, um, you have to give people the tools to do their job, the support to do their job. And the only thing you can do is, like I said, is like get up and do a good job every day and hope that some of that rubs off. And you know, if you figure out that it's not rubbing off, then they just have to go. That's, you know, the way it is. Right? Good. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. More questions? I'm just wondering, you said that you went to uh, London in 84 and bought antiques. What, what prompted you to do that? I mean, what, did you decide in advance that you were going to open a retail space or you... Boldness, I think. Um, I, I decided that I was going to start my store. Um, I wrote the plan in 84 and went off in 85 to do the buying. Um, I had to go with my gut. You know, something I always wanted to do. Um, you know, I rearranged my mother's furniture as much as I could, and then you just have to find other ways to express yourself. And I just knew that um, there was something inside that had to get out, and that was starting my own business. And I love that English concept of a store um, and a business where, you know, I started my business in the 80s, and I always loved places like George Spencer and Colfax and Fowler. And, Stores where you could go in and buy goods, you could buy fabric, you could buy furniture, accessories, and you could hire services. And you could do that just by walking in off the street. And I thought that was an incredibly user-friendly way to do business. Because not everybody wants to, you know, sign the big 12-page contract and, you know, lock you up. Um, they want to do bits and pieces. I thought that was a very democratic approach to decorating. So that's what I did. I, I really based it on that English um, uh, decorating store model. Good question. Hi, 
Hi. I really admire your authenticity. It's really a pleasure. Um, you spoke about charity work before. I wondered what, um, what, ex what kind of charity work you do. Um, I'd be really interested in knowing. Um, I am a trustee at, um, well, I don't view it as charity work. It's my not-for-profit work. Um, I'm a trustee at Monticello um, and as a trustee sit on several committees there. Um, I am on the Bone Marrow Foundation board and raise, help them raise money. Uh, I've been involved with UNICEF as project chair of the gala for about seven years and that's been terribly gratifying work. One, because I work with a great committee and two, we raise a boatload of money and we know where it's all going, and that's, you know, what makes the world go round. Um, you know, I'm on the executive um, committee with uh, Keith for LDC, so that's related to my business. And, um, you know, my husband would say I do too much, you know. Um, but I um, do other things, sit on other committees for other, for other charities. There's always another friend that needs you to chair an event or do something related to another event. Um, I sat on the board of the Graduate um, Study Center at Bard for about four or five years. And so it's, it's sort of a mix, um, things related to me personally. I love history, so Monticello is perfect for me, and things related to the business to give back. Hi. Could you provide some insight to the beginning of you starting your own business and also perhaps, you know, the ups and downs of trying to become profitable? <laughs> <laughs> There's always ups and downs in that. Um, you know, my business has always been sort of, you know, partly decorating, publishing, um, licensing. Some things are what I call near-term profitability and others are long-term. Licensing's more long-term. Um, when it comes to selecting the jobs and how to determine if they're profitable, is that the question? Like, how do you, how do you know if it's gonna be profitable? Not necessarily, just, I guess, oh, thank you. Not necessarily anything specific, I think it's just more of a broad question, you know, in the beginning, you trying to figure it out and maybe allocating your talents and resources and you know, trying to sustain yourself and grow, you know, whether it's your brand and your business through different, you know, means. You know, I, um, I think none of us really know in the beginning. You know, we're just praying like hell. Right. It's gonna, it, you know, there's going to be some money coming in. Um, but it's all get up in the morning, go to work, and work hard. Constantly be doing your homework. You know, some people feel that, you know, once you're there, you know, someone like Charlotte Moss, who's been doing it for 28 years, or whatever. You know, you don't have to work so hard anymore because you're, you know, you've achieved a certain level of success. That's not true. You just always got to keep running, always got to keep working, always doing your homework. You know, keeping up with popular culture and social media and all that stuff that affects my clients, our life, how we do our business. I mean, that is so much coming at us today. As I said earlier that we have to focus on. I think we have to learn to be very discriminating about how we spend our time, very selective about how we spend our time. And when you're starting your business, to be focused on those things that make the money first. And then when you make the money, then you can start to do some of those extra things. It's sort of like, you know, the reward you give yourself for having worked hard. Don't you also think that listening to your gut is so vital to anybody who crosses your path as far as that interaction? Oh, well, there's no question about that. I mean, I mean, there's probably not a person in this room that hasn't met someone where they just went, woof, <laughs> you know, woof. It's like bad aura, you know, you just know. Um, and, you know, look, I've known it from potential clients that, you know, will call and, you know, you'll have a meeting and then you ask a few more probing questions and you find out they've had five decorators before. And you go, five decorators, three houses, this is not a good sign. So then you start to ask a few more questions and you know, your gut starts to really kick in. Right. You know, you can just sort of 
get that vibration. And then there are other people you just warm to immediately. Um, I think I've always had that instinct with, with a lot of my clients, um, except for the one that I wished I never took on. <laughs> <laughs> Some more questions. Jordan, back there. There's something in Wall Street called due diligence. Every time you do a deal, you have to do your homework. You know, due diligence is homework on Wall Street. You know, and that's something that we need to think about also. You know, there was a time when you could maybe run a D&B on, on a client, you know. Now, you just go on Google. Oh, my God. You can find everything you want to know about somebody on Google. Um, and my, one of my defining criteria, are they philanthropic? Because people calling me to do work for them are wealthy. And if they're wealthy and they're not giving back, I'm not working for them. That's my criteria. I spend my time giving back something too. I feel very fortunate. And if people are not giving something back and all they're doing is, you know, conspicuous consumption types, no thank you. Yeah. Good point. Hi, Charlotte. Um, I, Katie Lead, and uh, good to see you, and it's wonderful listening to you speak. I have a question about licensing. I have a small boutique textile line, which I handle myself completely, um, from the design to the manufacturing and the shipping and everything. And, um, and Oops, sorry. Whoa. I'm exhausted already listening to right, you say all exactly. the things you do. <laughs> well, meaning, meaning um, I am very curious about what your experience is working, say, with a larger fabric house and what the design process is like for you and what do you ever wish you had more control or do you enjoy that process and what are, I mean, it looks like I, when I see, oh, Charlotte's coming out with, you know, if it's tableware or, or your fabrics or whatever, all the many, many products that you keep you know, coming through various various sources. I just wanted to know, are you pleased with that arrangement that you have um, worked well, out? Well, first of all, if you're not pleased with your arrangement, it's your own fault because you have an opportunity to sign a contract and to discuss terms, and those terms need to work for all parties. It's a collaboration. You know, you're not just putting your name on product. Um, you're a partner. And I've always viewed myself in licensing, and Keith will, can speak to this. I am a partner from the beginning, doing the research, through the marketing and the merchandising and everything. Because I sort of think vertically, you know, when it comes to that product. And I think maybe being a retailer is part of that too, because, you know, I see it, and then all of a sudden I see it in my mind's eye where it's going to sit in somebody's store, and then how I might pitch it, and what magazine might want to... Uh, you know, write about it or something. Um, I have found those relationships um, very gratifying. Um, when I did my collection with Brunchwig and with Fabricut, um, I worked with great studios, with very talented people. I learned so much from them. And I, I think in all of my licensing relationships, I've learned so much from them. And the guys in the factory, you know? You really got to get, get out there and roll up your sleeves. And I think once people realize that you're a partner with them, um, they'll, they're real, very forthcoming with what they know. And they really embrace you in a different kind of way. And I love that. Um, I remember one time sitting on the floor in a bathroom in a client's house during installation week. And the plumbers were just bitching and moaning about the type of plumbing fittings that I'd selected. <laughs> and um, they didn't have the washers and the this and the that, and you know, the client was moving in, and what we're gonna do, we're on the hotline to the plumbing company. And I said, so if you don't like this, what do you like? Man, he was so fast to tell me that. And that is how you learn from those people. So whether it's a decorating job or it's licensing, you learn so much if you listen. Well, I wanna add that consistently from all of Charlotte's licenses, we hear, you know, people are nervous at first about bringing a designer into their environment and designing uh, with you and in collaboration with you. And people are always saying, what an amazing collaborator you are, because you do take it so much further than what their expectation is, is not just handing over a napkin sketch. It's how are we gonna sell this? How are we gonna market it? Is it doing well? What should we switch? What do they like? What do they want more of? You, that's how you think. Well, it's a relationship. Yeah. 
And it's a relationship you want to go on for a long time because by the time you start working on a product, it could be a year, maybe two years working on a product line, and then it comes out, and now it's like, oh, what the hell? Now we got to <laughs> sell the stuff. And then you got to sell it for another you know, couple years. Um, and then it's that rite of passage. Once you're successful with that first collection, then you get a chance to do the second one. Um, but usually not until you're successful with the first one. All right. Let's take one more question. And then or maybe two. <laughs> what would you tell the woman that sat on the beach writing her business plan that she didn't know? What do you know now that you would tell her? You know, when I was on Wall Street, um, I didn't think people worked longer hours than that. <laughs> okay? I mean, I remember, I remember, seriously, I had a boss. I was like tiptoeing out one night. It was like 8.30, and I thought I was going to escape. And he goes, where are you going? And I said, um, home. And I actually had a date, finally. Anyway, <laughs> so um, he said, nope. And I was back in the office till like 11 o'clock at night. And I thought, this is insane. Nobody could work these kind of hours all the time, all the time, until I had my own business. <laughs> and you're it. You're it. Everything, you know, the buck stops, you know, you're it. And um, it's a huge time commitment. I don't think I was unrealistic about that, about the amount of time I was going to have to spend. Um, what else would I, the realization? I don't know. It's like we talked earlier. I don't think you think about what it's going to take to get somewhere. You just get up and do what you have to do every day. Flip on the lights, get a cup of coffee, and sit down and do it. Margaret, you had a question? Yep, sorry. One more. Um, I wanted to know if you have any suggestions on when someone's starting their own business, what they need to have established for themselves in order to be taken seriously or just to be really effective up front, like whether it's con a contract outline or just certain elements of the business in order before really putting themselves out there to try and get clients? Or should you just go for it and not worry about so much of that stuff up front? Well, that's the old Chinese proverb thing, you know, <laughs> leap in the net will appear. But I do think um, uh, no contract ever gets a client. You get the client. Client picks up the phone and calls you for a reason. But I think before you start your business, that's that chat you have to have with self. You know, what do I have to offer? Do I have enough to offer? Am I going to be credible um, in, in suggesting what I'm going to have to suggest? Spending somebody else's money, it's huge responsibility. Huge responsibility. Um, and to know that you should walk before you run. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Take the baby steps. It's okay. It's not embarrassing. You know, you take the small jobs. You take a bedroom here, you take a living room there, then you get a smaller apartment, then you get the bigger apartment. It's okay to work your way up to that. Um, I think it suggests that you're a realistic person. You're a realistic business person. So all I can say is hard work. But if somebody picked up the phone and called you first, then that's the first step. Okay, Margaret? Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Um, Charlotte, I think it's so interesting that... Well, not that Margaret. Okay, not that no. <laughs> It's Margaret. Yeah, not, not the other Margaret. Um, when Keith asked you about your legacy and what you would like to be remembered as, and you said being generous um, as someone who's worked on projects that have benefited from your generosity, I wanted to thank you because you truly, you've set a new standard for generosity and philanthropy in our business, and you should be very proud of that. Um, but I do have a question. You, you do so much, and you're involved in so many different things, and you blog, and you write, and you have the, the, the products that you design, and, and you design projects. How, how do you split your time? And a, a bigger question that's probably one for over dinner, how do, you know, how do you find balance? But I see so many people struggling with blogging and their design projects. 
how, how would you define your life right now? How much is design work for clients? You know, how much is sort of the, the business that you do? Um, how much is writing? And then all the philanthropy and everything else is separate. But specifically for what we're talking about for business of design right now, what's design, what's writing, what's product design? Mm. Wow, okay, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> and this will force me to really sit and think about this now. Um, you know, I took about a two-year hiatus from taking on new decorating projects. And um, I found it to be an incredibly clarifying experience for me. Because now we've started on three projects and um, I feel like I've, I'm renewed um, in how I'm looking at things now. Um, so starting from the beginning of the year, it'll be a lot more focused on design and maybe a little less writing. Um, I'm not as quick to jump at that next book right at this moment. Um, I have to make some proposals to the Wall Street Journal for writing for them. And um, blogging has slowed down in terms of writing. Um, again, it's being realistic with yourself about how you, what you can do well you know, um, I hate to use this expression, but it's a good southern one. We just don't like doing it half-assed, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> so you can't really do the blogging and do it that way, because you will really stand out as one of the weak ones. It's too visible. I can't break it down to percentages, Margaret. You know, I've always been, you know, I'm antsy, so I have to do those different things. Um, and then licensing, you know getting ready to work on another fabric collection. I think what it's constant bobbing and weaving. It's being very nimble. It's understanding how to manage your time and set priorities, and always looking at the timeline and working backwards. What's the due date? What are the steps ahead of it? How do I get there? And constantly, constantly redoing that. Um, but I love it all. You know, I love it all. That's the hard part. It's all those plate spinning classes you've been taking, right? Plate spinning classes? Yeah, yeah. No, it's the Pilates classes stretching me. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, this has yeah. been a real pleasure. Thank you, Charlotte. I do thank want you. to remind everybody that on February 21st, um, the next interview is with Mark Ferguson. So thank you for coming, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.